there's been over 20,000 people that have vanished over the Alaska Triangle. There are more people that have gone missing than anywhere on Earth when they've gone over the Alaska Triangle. It was a Japan Airlines cargo flight piloted by Captain Kenju Tarauchi. This is the sketch Tarauchi drew of what he says he saw at his window that night. And this Japanese television graphic is based on his description. This is uh, just a small space. We, see. we can see a uh, oh, uh, big thing. This one is the uh, size of a uh, uh, carrier, so uh, mother ships. Bigger than an aircraft carrier, Tarauchi claimed when he drew this sketch showing the relative size of his jumbo jet. Tarauchi's route was over Alaska to Anchorage. He says the UFO stayed with him 40 minutes and then disappeared. Today, the FAA released tapes of the crew's conversation with controllers. Japan Air 1628, if you're able to identify the type of aircraft, uh, so we cannot identify uh, the type. They're uh, coming uh, uh, like a formation. Formation. It's uh, quite a big. But Tarauchi's crewmates were not sure they'd seen a UFO, and other planes sent to look saw nothing unusual. The FAA agrees. Today, the agency concluded a three-month investigation, saying there's nothing to substantiate the pilot's story, nothing to indicate a UFO or any other aircraft near the flight. 20,000. Okay, think about that. If that was reported anywhere else, like any town, any country, that 20,000 people have, have gone missing in this little portion, there would be serious concern. And for some reason, because it's over the waters in Alaska, it, fall, it kind of flies under the radar. A Boeing 747 into Anchorage, Alaska, and they were followed for hundreds of miles by this huge UFO, which was described uh, as a bowl inverted upon a bowl with a rim around it we call the satin-type configuration. Uh, the pilots, pilot and the crew members described it as being as large as two aircraft carriers placed side by side. They tracked it on their weather radar to make sure that they weren't seeing things. They were in contact with the FAA at Anchorage and also Elmendorf Air Force Base. And they have said and they've maintained their story uh, that, that both locations also tracked it on radar. It wasn't mentioned in the press. It was kept very quiet. It broke in Japan around December 30th, December 31st, and got back into the press in this country after a month. And immediately, the FAA officials contradicted their own controllers. The Air Force uh, spokesmen also contradicted their own radar operators and told the press that, uh, the FAA told the press that the radar uh, was just a double image of the plane. Uh, Elmendorf Air Force Base officially said that they were just picking up ground clutter. Uh, the two smaller objects, that, which was the scene with the big objects, were described as being uh, Mars and Jupiter, although they didn't look like Mars and Jupiter at all. And the last I heard was that the FAA controllers were very upset about this, and the Japanese uh, uh, pilots and pilot and the crew members are still sticking to their story, regardless of what uh, our government uh, says. Now, a lot of people are curious on why so many people are going missing in this part of Alaska. Now, Alaska has over 30,000 miles of coast, okay? And it has some of the deepest water on Earth. So many people believe that the extraterrestrials that are coming to Earth are going down into the Alaska Triangle where there's possibly a base so deep down that we could never get to. So down the line, things change, and now you have whistleblowers that came out and were able to finally you know, say I had a government clearance and this is what happened. And throughout that time, there was a guy named Dan Willis and this guy worked for the Navy and he was the guy in the back room reading all the Morse code from the ships. And one night he was in his office and a message came in and the message said that there were orange and red lights underneath the water one of the ships in the area saw it. They said it was huge. And it came up out of the water, these huge lights, and shot into the sky. And so now, this guy, Dan Willis, is sitting in his office, and he's basically, you know, think like, you know, Titanic. Like, doo, 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 doo. like that's coming in. He's transcripting this Morris code. 
And basically it's saying like, you know, we saw this UFO come out of the water, like we're reporting it to you first. And so he took it into his office, the code, after he wrote it down and showed his bosses and never, never heard anything else about it. But for the, for years, he was wondering like, what was that? You know, it was completely swept underneath the rug. Now times have changed and he was able to come out in, um, a press conference and tell the world what happened. My name is Dan Willis. I was in the United States Navy. I held a top secret crypto level 14 extra sensitive material handling security clearance. I worked in the code room at the Naval Communication Station in San Francisco. In 1969, I received a priority message from a ship near Alaska that uh, was classified as secret. The ship reported uh, merging out of the ocean uh, near Port Bow, a brightly glowing uh, reddish-orange elliptical object, approximately 70 feet in diameter, merged out of the water, <coughs> shot into space, uh, traveling at about 7,000 miles per hour. This was uh, tracked on ship's radar and substantiated. Uh, years later, I worked at the um, Naval Electronic Engineering Center in San Diego for 13 years. The um, co-worker who I worked with worked at the NORAD facility. When he first started working at the facility, he noticed objects going on the screens to track everything out in space and in the air. Objects going off the scale, doing right angle turns when he inquired. Uh, his older supervisor advised him that, uh, quote, it was just a visit from one of our little friends. He thought this was a little unusual. Uh, these statements are true and willing to testify under oath before Congress. Thank what you. sticks out to me most is the color of the lights that he said. If you listen to any of the UFO encounters from the past, they always said red orange lights like literally keep if you could just keep going back to all my videos and every time i mention what the lights look like it's always red and orange it's always fire right it's almost all all the encounters from the past have been these fire looking lights in the sky i got right over to this stone over here i'd say close to this stone wall and this is when this thing appeared and it was like it came out of nowhere i was just zap all of a sudden, there it was, big as a house up over these trees. And he observed this craft uh, hovering over a home right next to uh, where he was. Uh, the home was completely bathed in red light. The area was bathed in red light. There was no sound. Right? And that's what makes UFOs so convincing is that everybody is seeing the same thing. All of these cases build on top of one another. Right? When you learn one of them, you go to the next one, then you'll see the connections. It's like a big puzzle that all comes together.